Hi, this is Alan, and I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick rundown on the O2 hazards. Uh, I know I have some other clips on YouTube right now, but uh, I just want to quick give you a rundown. Now, this is not a complete detailed definition, but we need to start somewhere. Um, what I'm going to do is first start with uh, absorption atelectasis. Absorption atelectasis, let's think of the words. Absorption. Absorption. What's being absorbed? The nitrogen. Where is the nitrogen? The nitrogen can be found throughout the whole body, in the alveoli, in the blood, and in the body cavities. When we give high levels of oxygen greater than 50% very quickly to a patient, what will happen is these nitrogen levels are going to be washed out. They're going to get into the venous system and they're going to be removed. That means the body cavity, the alveoli, no longer has, no longer has this nitrogen level available to help keep the alveoli open. So now without that pressure, keeping the alveoli open, the alveoli will shrink. Now the only thing that's left in the alveoli is the oxygen. When the oxygen crosses the AC membrane, it goes into the blood, there's nothing left to keep the alveoli open and it collapses. When I have a bunch of collapsed alveoli, that is known as atelectasis. So I have the absorption of nitrogen due to the high administration of oxygen greater than 50%, which leads to the atelectasis, which is the collapse of alveoli. Who does this and where does this occur frequently? This occurs when we have patients who are breathing small tidal volumes. This can be due to uh, post-operative pain or maybe even sedation. But the key here is breathing small tidal volumes. Does it normally happen in patients who can breathe normal tidal volumes and occasionally take a side breath? This has been absorption atelectasis. The next one is O2 toxicity. O2 toxicity is oxygen that becomes toxic. You have to remember that oxygen is a drug. Too much of a drug can be a bad thing. When you deliver oxygen to a patient, I want you to think of a couple of things. First thing, the PO2. How much oxygen you're going to expose the lung to. And that PO2, okay, the amount of PO2 that we expose the lung to over a period of time. As we increase this time, what we end up doing is that we put the lung in harm's way. Why? The O2 releases free radicals. And in my book, being radical is probably not a good thing. And these free radicals being released in the lungs are going to destroy type 1 alveolar cells and proliferate or multiply type 2. These uh, multiplication of type 2 alveolar cells forces the lungs to go into an exudative stage or a fluid buildup. When this fluid builds up in the lungs, it makes it more difficult for oxygen to be able to go from in the lung and across the AC membrane, decreasing the ventilation portion, even though I have plenty of perfusion going to the lungs. So in essence, I have an increase in my VQ mismatch. This increased VQ mismatch and exposure level of oxygen in the lung, if that goes unchecked, for a longer period of time, what will end up happening is we will end up having a thickening of the AC membrane. This thickening of the AC membrane will and can lead to something called ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Another thing I would hope that you would remember, besides this PO2 times time, is this circle. And this circle is the vicious cycle. What, why do we give a patient oxygen? Because they have a low partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. What do we do? What's wrong? Decrease PaO2. What do we do? Increase the FiO2. When should we stop? When the underlying condition that put us, made us put the patient on oxygen has been resolved. But remember, oxygen releases free radicals and it can destroy lung tissue. We've already been through the definition of what it does. Destroying type 1, proliferating type 2, increasing fluid levels in the lungs, causing non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. What do we need to do now is stop exposing the lung to so much oxygen. But if we, the respiratory therapists, don't do this and don't keep a close watch on the patient, what will end up happening is 
Well, initially I had a low PaO2, I increased the FiO2, and guess what? My saturation and PaO2 improved, but my exposure to the O2 still continued on. I had a longer increased time of exposure to oxygen in the lung. So what ends up happening? I end up increasing the FiO2 even more, destroying more parts of the lung, furthering my VQ mismatch. So I'm going to have more of a problem with ventilation to perfusion. Perfusion's fine, but ventilation is having a problem because of this fluid buildup. Well, if this goes unchecked, PaO2 will further go down, knee-jerk reaction, increase the FiO2. Oh, that sounds real smart. Let's expose the lung to even more free radicals. All of a sudden, you're destroying lung segment after lung segment that it gets to a point where there is almost no ventilation whatsoever, just some perfusion going on, and that is called shunting. The blood is just getting to the lung and shunting right by with no gas exchange occurring. Okay? VQ mismatch, ventilation to perfusion, not having enough ventilation, plenty of perfusion. What is shunting? It is the same thing as a VQ mismatch, but shunting is a VQ mismatch on steroids. Okay, that's an analogy. It is a terrible case. It's a very severe, severe case of a VQ mismatch. Now that was O2 toxicity. The next disease process I'm going to talk about is um, ROP or RLF, retinopathy of prematurity or retrolindal fibroplasia. This occurs in low birth weight low birth weight infants less than one month of age and typically these patients are going to have underdeveloped lungs or some have some kind of lung injury which is going to require them to be on some oxygen. Well when we deliver oxygen to these patients this special patient classification what will happen is what could happen I should say is that the vessels behind the eye they will necrose and it will not feed oxygen to that back part of the eye. New vessels will grow over top of those necrosed or dead vessels and these newer vessels are weaker and they will rupture if the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood is still too high. Well when these blood vessels rupture they scar over and then new ones grow and they're weaker and no one keeps an eye on the PaO2 they're gonna rupture heal over, scar, new ones grow. This continual process, just like O2 toxicity, becomes a vicious cycle, okay? That vicious cycle will end up with all that scarring causing the partial detachment or full detachment of the retina leading to blindness. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that uh, we keep the PaO2 less than 80 millimeters of mercury. Now that's kind of a, a unique thing that you have to remember that we said the normal PaO2 range for a patient is 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Now we're saying that we need to keep the PaO2 for this patient classification less than 80. Yes, we want to keep it less than 80, but we don't want it to be below 60. So we want to be between 60 and 80 millimeters of mercury, which would mean that this patient has some hypoxemia and that would be classified as a mild hypoxemia but it's still adequate for this patient classification based on the conditions of the lung. Okay, the fourth hazard that we're going to talk about is O2 induced hypoventilation. I like to say it like that instead of oxygen induced or uh, depression of ventilation. O2 induced hypoventilation, oxygen which causes a reduction in ventilation. What patients does this happen to? This happens to us uh, or can happen to a special classification of patients who are known as COPD CO2 retainers. Okay? They're special because they have a lot of CO2 built up in their body. Now, COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic meaning long period of time. This didn't happen overnight. This the lung problem was a long time in the process. Well, this COPD CO2 retainer has had problems getting rid of carbon dioxide. Earlier in their life, when their lung wasn't as damaged, they increased their respirations. How did they do that? Their hypoxic drive. 
you'll be surprised to know that you and I and the COPD CO2 retainer, we all have hypoxic drives and we all have peripheral chemoreceptors. The only thing different with us who have a fully functioning hypoxic drive and fully functioning peripheral chemoreceptors is that the COPD CO2 retainer, their hypoxic drive is blunted, not working, shut down, out of business. It doesn't respond anymore. Why should it? There's been so much lung damage over a, a, a chronic period of time, long period of time, that even if the patient was to breathe faster and harder, it's not going to do any good. They're having a decrease in ventilation. They can't get the CO2 out of the body. So the, for all intents and purposes, the hypoxic drive gets shut down. It's no longer functioning. This patient breathes solely on the peripheral chemoreceptors, and this is a very crude and very vague definition, but it's going to respond, the peripheral chemoreceptors are going to respond to uh, the amount of oxygen in the bloodstream. Well, if you deliver too much oxygen to a COPD, CO2 retainer, their hypoxic drive is broken, shut down, not working, and they're going to breathe only by the peripheral chemoreceptors. So if you give too much oxygen to these patients, guess what? they're going to think that they don't need to breathe as much. Who's thinking that? The peripheral chemoreceptors. Why? Because you're administering too much oxygen. How do you prevent that? Don't give them too much oxygen. Most of the time you're gonna see a COPD, CO2 retainer on one or two liter nasal cannula. If you really wanna make sure that they don't get too much, you can put them on a venturi mask or air entrainment mask, probably 28 to 30%. Key, another thing I wanna make point here is do not ever withhold oxygen from a patient, okay? If for some reason that patient requires more O2 than that, you can give it to them because you can help them breathe, but once the tissue in the brain or the heart has been destroyed because of a lack of oxygen, you can't get that tissue back. So, but we could intubate that patient if their drive to breathe was d diminished, okay? Again, that was O2 induced hypoventilation, okay? Thank you. And if you have any questions, just send me an email.